Hey everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be here, and I think, uh, yeah, I think we're at time, so let's start. Um, as Frank said, uh, Kevin and I, we used to uh, work at UNLV, this is like four or five years ago, and we worked in their department when Frank was starting out and, you know, doing his thing. So that was really fun and exciting. Uh, learned a lot. Uh, Kevin was just saying this earlier when we were talking, we were like, oh, it's kind of weird. We're the ones using the mics and the lapels <laughs> and using the AV. And we're not the ones actually managing it. So it's kind of funny being on the other side, you know. But um, yeah, let's get started. Uh, again, my name is LaShawn Diaz. Uh, that is Kevin Duong Tran. Uh, and we, uh, we want to show you guys some, uh, basically, how, how we can take a look at AR and VR technology and how to integrate that, again, into a classroom setting or into a university kind of setting. Um, I want to kind of talk through really quick the kind of stuff we're going to review today. So four, four things we're going to do. We're going to just do a little quick intro about us and what we do, and as well as an intro into AR and VR, in case you guys are not familiar. Um, then I want to jump into strategies and thinking about, OK, what is it, you know, what are we actually going to do? How do we actually integrate this technology into the classroom, make it scalable, make it accessible, and all those other things. And then the last thing, uh, well, second to last thing, is uh, we're going to do a live demo of some of the stuff that we're talking about today, and hopefully, uh, no technical snags and things will work okay as live demos go. And then I'll open up the floor to any uh, questions. So uh, please, uh, if you do have questions, you know, feel free to write them down and you know, get ready to blast them at me at the end. Um, uh, I think uh, we're going to go ahead and just jump right in and just go with the intro. So um, again, my name's LaShawn. Uh, just to give you a little background on me, uh, you know, as you know, you know, I used to work with Frank and Rohan and the, the crew here at UNLV at OIT. Um, and then after that, I kind of transitioned into more of a role uh, in, uh, as a designer, as a UX designer specifically, d designing uh, digital products. Uh, and then from there, you know, again, another transition into product strategy. So this is product strategy, product management for, uh, you know, software, uh, specifically enterprise software. So uh, a lot of the stuff that I worked on in the past couple of years has been with two, uh, and these are just two local examples I want to point out, is uh, folks at Zappos, you know, we, um, my team spent about a year building out a learning management system uh, for them, a completely custom, and we, we got that rolled out and I got that in their hands and rolled out to their employees. Also did some work recently with Southwest Gas, which is a utility company here in town and other parts of uh, you know, the Southwest uh, that uh, um, we basically helped them with a IT requisition system, you know, creating some sort of uh, kind of pipeline workflow to help them uh, streamline. How, the, how, their cust how their customers, how their employees get their uh, IT software. Um, that, that was, that's been kind of my start. And then from there, uh, it was about, we'll say two years ago, like two to three years ago, about in 2016, uh, Kevin and I, we decided, hey, uh, AR and VR is such a cool thing. It just kind of came out. The first few headsets started releasing. Let's, let's try to figure out how we can take this and make it into something really cool, something really great. So what we uh, landed on was creating a, starting a business uh, called Solitas. And what we did was uh, turn it into a VR agency. So we would create uh, VR experiences that um, specifically for architects, engineers, people in the construction industry, we would create those kinds of experiences and let people uh, basically experience um, whatever it is they're trying to build before they actually build it. So. We started there, uh, and we ended up landing uh, a couple of really awesome, fun clients that we ended up working with, um, like Gensler, which is a pretty big uh, architecture firm uh, that's, I think they're international. Uh, and then same with Whiting Turner. They're, they have a local office here in town, but um, they're also uh, national ar around the country. So we started with that, and then that was kind of our dipping the toes into VR and what that technology looks like. And over the years, that's kind of changed. You know, it's, there's a lot more hardware and headsets and software that's come out, and we've also changed our path along with that. So um, I, I want to talk a little bit more into that later, but um, th that's kind of who I am and who we are and wh what we're uh, hopefully uh, been doing, and hopefully uh, I can show you what we plan to do too. So um, that's enough about me. I want to know about you. So maybe we can run through a couple questions, raise a hand kind of thing. So um, of everyone in here, who here is familiar with AR and VR? Just show hands. All right, good, good, good. All right, so hopefully this isn't uh, anything groundbreaking or revolutionary. But for those that may, may not be, hopefully we'll cover a lot of ground and give you a good idea of the landscape of AR and VR as it is today and how that impacts you. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, another question. What is, um, uh, have you tried VR? If, uh, raise a hand if you've actually tried VR. Put on that headset and try it out. 
Okay, still a good amount. Um, how about AR? Who's actually tried AR out themselves? We got two. Okay, got it. This is cool. So that's really good to hear because uh, a lot of the presentation that I'm going to be running through today is going to focus on AR uh, and how, again, it's differing from VR and how, and my belief, which is that AR is really going to be the thing that propels us into the future. VR is what kind of started us and got us here, but AR is the future. Um, and eventually it's going to kind of merge into one thing, really, is kind of the, the, the belief that we have. So hopefully we can run through a little bit of that. Um, so let's get started with, I guess, the actual differences, right? So I think this is a, a, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be going through in the beginning. It might feel a little redundant, but I'm going to go through it anyways just so it's there and we have a good uh, you know, baseline to start with. So th this is my personal definition. I know there's other definitions of things, right? But you know, I look at it as virtual reality replaces the real world, right? It makes everything go away and everything's digital. It's everything you see. Then on the other hand, you have AR, which is it's adding to the real world. It's adding an extra layer, so to speak. Uh, you know, I like to call it, it's, it's your hologram, right? It's, I'm looking at this room and there's a hologram there and I can interact with it and kind of see what's going on. So that's kind of, again, baseline how that works. And there's other things that I've kind of been thrown in the mix to. There's things like mixed reality, which you might have heard of, MR, right? And for me personally, again, I, I believe that MR is just a rebranded, MR is just rebranded augmented reality. That's all that is. Um, it's, you know, Microsoft's kind of thing and a couple other manufacturers there, they've been using that terminology instead. But at its core, it's VR and AR. Those are the two components. Um, but n I want to kind of take a look at this and let's hold on to this and let's think about what does this look like in the scope of everything, all the things that we've done in the computing world, right? So in technology. So this is kind of, you know, us going from back in the day, you know, mainframe computing, IBM mainframes, and going into actual desktop personal computing, finally mobile computing in the 2000s, and then now we're getting into this new age, this new era, so to speak, of spatial computing. That's like the terminology, I guess, that I use, and I've heard a lot of other folks use to kind of define it. And I think the thing that I want to really point out here on this slide is none of these things ever went away. It's not like one went away and it got replaced by something else, got replaced by something else. This is always additive, and it's always growing, it's always improving. Right, like we, you know, those mainframes are now basically cloud servers. You know, those, those, uh, you know, Apple IIs or Apple IIes or whatever it is. You know, those are now your iMacs or your desktop PCs. Um, those, Palm, those Palm Pilots, those PDAs, those Blackberries are now our iPhones and Android phones. And I think we're now also beginning to go into the, the start of this spatial computing piece, where you know we have hardware like the Oculus Rift or the HTC Vive, and now that's again, we don't really know what that future looks like. It's it's going to change. That's you know that's almost. Uh, uh, it, it, like, there's no way it's not going to. It's, it's going to keep changing. It's going to keep evolving, just like how we've seen these other devices evolve too. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of, again, thinking of AR and VR as just another layer to this whole thing. I think another thing I like to think about here is spatial computing being not just AR and VR, but also bearing in other things like, uh, uh, I always say <laughs> IoT. There you go. Got it. <laughs> IoT. So like IoT devices, this is, again, devices talking to each other working together, it's again another layer on top of what we already have. Um, and then I look at again, spatial computing, the, the VR and AR piece, specifically being what you see, right? So there's other layers to that. There's a data layer, there's the, the IoT stuff, there's all those things. So I won't dwell on this too much, but uh, again, just kind of want to give this good context here. Um, this is, I guess, my next section here. I want to kind of walk through again, just really quickly what the, the different types of VR and AR look like today. So this is, um, this is Google Earth and VR. Um, uh, has anyone in here tried this out yet? So it's really awesome. The way it works is you put on the headset, right? Everything in the room goes away, and you see the world. And you can actually fly around and see the world as it you know, w actually looks like based off Google Earth. Uh, it's actually really exciting, really cool. This is, I know, just like terrain and you know landscapes like that. But you can go into a city, you can go into Paris, you can go into Tokyo. You can see all those things pretty much as if it was as if you were actually there. So really awesome experience with that. Uh, another really quick kind of demonstration of what that looks like again is this is again VR. This is also made by Google. This is called Tilt Brush. Has anyone in here tried this out before? So Tilt Brush, you know, very simple program. It's basically the Microsoft Paint of VR, right? Uh, it lets you paint and be creative. It's just a, it's a tool, really. It, again, blacks out your whole world. You can't see anything. You just see your, your canvas, so to speak, which is the world around you. So with those two, I guess, examples in mind, I kind of want to run through the different uh, hardware 
that's been coming out and releasing this year. This is, most of this is either just recently released or going to be released you know, quarter three, quarter four this year. So I want to run through, I guess, this bit really quickly and kind of give you an idea of what's out there on the market. What, what are the things that we have to look forward to? So on the left side, we have one type of headset, which is the, the headsets that are tethered to your desktop. This is kind of what we're used to. This is you have a headset. It's got a wire coming out the back. It goes into your computer. It gives power, but it also gives the video output as well. Um, and then on the, the right side, we have w the headsets that are kind of kind of new, which is the fully wireless ones. So they give the same level of fidelity, the same level of detail, you know, or, or close enough. We'll say 80% of the ones on the left. But these are fully wireless. They do not require a computer. You just put it on and you go. Uh, of course, all of these they come with controllers too, you know, so you can interact and do those things. But I'm just focusing on again the headsets right now. The other really awesome thing that's been happening this year in 2019 is we're seeing the shift. We're seeing the shift away from VR headsets that need a sensor to detect where you are. These ones are completely sensorless. They don't need sensors at all. It's just the headset. You put it on, you're good to go. So that's, again, just again really quick uh, run through of what this looks like. Uh, like I was saying before, you know, this Oculus Rift S, it's, it's recently released, I think, in the last month. Uh, so it is available now. This HTC Vive Cosmos, this was released, uh, this was announced at CES earlier this year. Um, and they had it there to kind of have people try it out. Um, so hopefully end of this year or beginning of next, we'll see that come out. Oculus Quest, that's coming out very, very soon. Very excited for that. That's the, that's the one I'm really looking forward to. Um, and then finally, we have this HTC Vive Focus, which is kind of a more, again, the same kind of thing with the same kind of thing that they already have. It's just wireless, and it's more uh, enterprise ready is the way they kind of sell this specific unit. And all of these, I just want to mention, uh, live within the kind of uh, the price range, price bracket of maybe, we'll say, sub $600 headsets. Right? So that is, I would say, you know, 400 600 is kind of where we've been floating for VR headsets right now. It was a little bit more before, and now we're kind of bringing that cost down. Because again, this is for consumers to use, consumer VR. But I can see a huge application of using this in a classroom scenario or in a, a workplace scenario. So that's consumer VR. Uh, I'm going to come back to this and show exactly how we could integrate something like this into a classroom. But let, I'm going to move on to the next one, the next type, which is uh, what I call premium AR. So this is, a, this is basically off of a HoloLens, if you guys have heard of that. Um, has anyone in here tried a HoloLens out before? So this is actually off the brand new HoloLens that came out. We'll say they released it about a month ago. Uh, There's a lot of announcements last quarter. So that was very exciting to see this kind of thing. This, uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, it's a hologram. That's what it is. You put it on, you can still see the real world around you, and you can interact with it as if it was actually there. So really exciting, really cool. Um, another headset, uh, so this one isn't as fun of a demo, but still really cool. This is using the Magic Leap. Has anyone heard of that or used that before? So Magic Leap, really cool. Uh, they, they're backed by Google, and they have a bunch of funding. They've been really low-key for a while. And very recently, they've been releasing kind of a dev kit. So that way, you know, developers can purchase that uh, kit and start building experiences for that. And again, it looks, it looks and feels just like a hologram. And the cool thing we're showing here is that it doesn't have to be, you know, a finger tapping kind of experience. You could still use a controller to manipulate with the objects in the scene that you see around you. So that's, again, you know, premium AR. And I want to kind of walk through what that looks like as well. So again, Magic Leap, that's available. That's backed by Google. HoloLens 2, that was just released. And they are, Microsoft says they're shipping those, we'll say Q3 2019 if you get approved. Good job, Microsoft. Um, and finally, th this has been the most exciting piece for me um, personally, which is the Apple glasses. This was, um, this was not announced. This was rumored. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it was, again, maybe about a month and a half ago the, that Apple is going to be releasing their contender to compete with, again, Microsoft, Google, and others for a premium AR headset, uh, AR experience. Um, and that'll be either you know, uh, end of this year, best case scenario, you know, or beginning of 2020. I think I'm going to go with 2020 because you know, Apple's going to make that good marketing pun with 2020 and glasses, you know, right? <laughs> so anyways, uh, that is, this is kind of what that looks like right now. And I think the thing that's going to, uh, the thing to consider here is, you know, this is, again, premium AR. This is, this feels like it's more experimental. This is more early. You know, it doesn't have as much development time put into it as compared to the consumer-facing VR stuff that I showed before. This stuff here, um, 
I would say is it's, it's a lot more expensive. This is, this is in that $3,000 you know, per headset price range. Um, and again, it's, I think it's going to take a little time to, to get this to a mature enough state where this is ready for folks to use on a regular basis. But I think it's still very exciting to see the developments and the progress over the past couple years. Um, last, but definitely not least, I want to get into the thing that I am the most excited about because this is applicable today. Uh, this is mobile AR. So again, mobile AR is very similar to what we have with the premium AR, but this is again using a mobile device that you probably already have. So in this case, you know, we're seeing uh, someone pulling out their iPad and they're going through this kind of learning experience, uh, kind of deconstructing the, the earth and looking at the different layers, the core, the mantle, et cetera. So th there's all these different experiences that, um, that, you know, where you can do this exact thing. You can, if you have an iPad with you right now or an iPhone or e even some of the Android devices, you can pull that out and you can download these apps and you can try it out yourself. Um, uh, here's another one. This one is really, really fun. Uh, the, not, what this is, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's more fun than it is like learning and experience, but the great thing about this is this is actually showcasing a multiplayer experience. If you, if you look in the kind of middle of the iPad, there's another person with an iPad, and they're also interacting with this same environment. This, this all these building blocks that are on the table, right? Like, they're doing that together, and I think that's also very special, very unique. That's a, I don't see that happening a lot with VR and even the premium AR stuff, is this idea of a multiplayer. So, Again, super exciting, and again, this is accessible. This is super easy for someone to download and use today. Um, and I think that's, again, the thing that gets me the most excited about it, and hopefully you too. So I want to talk through, I guess, the software on this side, because it's not really hardware-specific um, th that it works. Well, I guess that's a lie. It is hardware-specific, and I'll get into that. So the two pieces, you know, depending on if you're on an Apple device or an Android device, is you know, it's AR Kit and AR Core. Um, uh, just by a show of hands, how many people in here have Apple devices? Okay, that's like everyone. How about uh, Android devices? Okay, a couple of people, still pretty good. Uh, uh, so the the great part about ARKit and these apps um, is that they work on a lot of Apple devices. You know, this is almost any any device made. You know, in the past like couple years, you know, it's it's going to be supported as long as you're on the latest iOS, you're good to go. You can download these AR apps, these AR this AR software and use that to whatever to do whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, uh, AR Core, on the other hand, you know, it's super awesome, really great, uh, but there, it's a little bit more limited in, in the hardware that it's supported on. So I only have a couple on here. There's actually a full list of maybe about 40 devices, but they are mostly the higher end kind of Android devices as well as maybe two or three um, Android tablets that are out on the market, um, like this uh, Chromebook Tab 10. Uh, I think uh, Acer makes that one. So this is kind of, I guess, w what I, again, believe and think that is the, the feasible solution for today and the thing that's going to scale into amazing, rich experiences in the future um, is these AR Core and AR Kit experiences that are being created by developers today. So my hope is that you know, folks can adopt this kind of technology because, again, you already have the hardware for it. You can start using it and try playing with it. And then what happens is all these, all the software that's made for this can get ported to this future, you know, AR headset. This even AR slash VR kind of mixed, true spatial computing headset. You know, th th that is the hope. That that's the roadmap that you know the all the manufacturers you know align with and kind of make happen. So that is, I guess, the quick but also not so quick run through of where we're at today and all the different you know, tools and hardware and software that you can use to, again, use AR, or AR and VR. Uh, the next step, I'm going to basically, uh, I'm going to run through the strategies, I guess, of how to get these things in the hands of people, you know, how do we do that in an effective way, and then, again, based off your use case, you know, like, what is the best strategy for you, you know, what is the best hardware to choose, and, um, I guess, kind of running through what that looks like. So. Um, I know every, you know, classroom, school, university is going to be different, and I'm just giving kind of a shot in the dark of what that might look like. So I want to start again with consumer-facing VR. So I know, you know, there, there's going to be three basic steps for a lot of these, which is, you know, getting the hardware, you know, making sure that you commit to the right kind of hardware platform that has the support that you desire, you know, depending on if you're uh, already running on Windows or Mac or whatever that looks like. Um, and you know, once that hardware is there, then it's about finding the space and then actually figuring out the, the process of getting the software that your users, you know, your students, your faculty would need uh, onto, those, onto that hardware and being able to distribute it. I think distribution is the one part that is, um, 
it's the trickiest part about AR, about VR that maybe people you know forget about. And you know, it's kind of a, a a thing you think about after the fact. It's like, oh wait, I have a bunch of headsets, and now I need to get all the same software to all these different computers and machines. How do I manage that? Do I just use traditional you know imaging? Do I use something like Steam, you know, which is a uh, a platform for VR experiences and other um, you know video games and kind of other um, rich media experiences like that. So. This is again just kind of a, a quick run through of what that looks like. And again, this is specifically for those Oculus and those Vive headsets. I know I'm focusing on the Oculus and Vive headsets. I know there's plenty of other ones, but I'm just focusing on those because they are the industry leaders as far as um, what I've seen so far. Uh, they, they have the most market share as far as people using those headsets. So, again, really quick overview of what that looks like. Um, next up, I have uh, pretty much the same thing, but for AR. Now, the thing here that changes is that because of the higher price point, this is something that um, might not be best suited for, uh, I skipped over a little bit, like in here and here in, in consumer VR, having it in a lab kind of scenario totally makes sense. Having it where you have an entire classroom full of, here's a bunch of computers, here's a bunch of headsets, go in, do the thing you gotta do. Maybe there's one lab you know, on the campus or wherever that looks like where they can go do those things. I think here in this case, it's gonna be a little bit different. It's more of a, hey, let's, get, let's have a maker space. Let's have a place that has 3D printers and other kind of hardware like that, specialty hardware. You know, th that, that's where I fit in these, this premium AR kind of experience. Um, my hope is that you know, by getting the, these kinds of premium AR headsets into a space, have one or two of them, students or faculty can now try those out, try out that experience, get the software they want to use on there, and really, again, start to explore what that looks like and get ready for what that future looks like as well. Um, the last piece right here is, again, mobile AR, which, again, the one that I'm most excited about. And this is, this is, this is probably the harder way to do it. There's probably an easier way, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So in this case, you, know, you have a, uh, you know, a lab or some sort of thing. You have some way of doing, uh, you know, getting the, those, uh, the devices that you choose, whether it be iOS or Android, you know, being able to do the MDM, the mobile device management, to be able to distribute software to that, those apps. Uh, or I'm sorry, distribute apps to, those, to, the, to the hardware, and then finally be able to get it where now folks are able to check out those iPads, check out those tablets, whatever it looks like, and then try, out, try it out for themselves. I think, again, this is probably the harder way. The easier way probably is, hey, bring your own device. Our classrooms are supported with AirPlay or whatever mirroring you know, support we have. So you can use your device and throw it up on a screen and actually present or collaborate or whatever it is that you want to do. I think this is something that needs, more people need to know about, right, is being able to you know, c come in and do those kinds of things. And I think that's really half the battle, right, is there's the technology piece, but there's also the awareness piece. So the more we can do that, the more we can get integration with you know, the, you know, the professors and faculty being able to endorse this kind of stuff and say, hey, let's, let's do a thing, let's use this app, let's, let's figure out what that looks like. I think the better uh, setup will be for the future again, for what this next level of you know, when this AR glasses comes out or whatever that it looks like. So those are those three things, and I kind of want to do one last quick recap of you know, what to choose depending on what you're looking for. So um, I guess let's start on the left side. Um, I know there's a lot on this slide, but we'll, we'll get through it. So the left side is kind of you know, this desk. It's, it's going to be general purpose VR, right? So this is, and, and the only difference between the top and the bottom on the left side is one is desktop first, one is mobile enabled, right? So if you want to be able to go anywhere you want, put on that headset, and like whether you're you know, outside the classroom or within the lab or whatever it is, you want to go for that mobile enabled one. The other one, the desktop first one, that one stays put. That one stays with the desktop. It doesn't move anywhere. Sure, you can walk around within the general area, but otherwise you're going to be there. And I think that's really the, the two differentiating factors between those two. Um, and then we look at the right side. You know, this, is, this is us talking about um, AR and figuring out you know, which one do we go for. And I, again, I guess to reiterate, the, the Magic Leap, the HoloLens, that's more experimental. That's more small scale. The, the, that's the way I see it. You know, s some, some departments might have bigger budgets and they, maybe they do want to invest in getting 10 of those or 20 of those, right? But I feel like that kind of investment today might not be the best unless it's totally okay with it. Uh, un you know, okay with the not getting the return on investment. Um, again, this is great for desktop apps with few users uh, is the way I look at that. And then finally, we have, I think, again, I think the best case scenario for today, which is this mobile AR, which is this is general purpose, this is widely available, Anyone is, you know, anyone that has a phone, anyone that has that tablet, they can download those apps and experience what AR lo really looks like, and hopefully grow with AR as AR grows into new devices and new hardware. Um, 
Now, I guess the, the thing that, the reason why I'm really excited is because we want to show you guys what this mobile AR might look like uh, with our live demo. So I guess I'm going to pause there um, and let me, let me think if I missed anything else. I feel like I'm good. And I think we're going to jump Kevin on a stage and we're just going to do that live demo. So Rohan, if you could uh, switch that input. Testing takes. OK, sounds good. You ready, Kevin? Yeah. Um, so let me give me a second to load up the demo. Sure. Um, I don't know who's doing that. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, uh, while Kevin gets the demo ready to go, um, I want to give you guys a little bit of a preface on what we're going to be showing off. So again, uh, Kevin and I started Stall House uh, about two years ago when uh, VR became a big thing. And since then, we've pivoted a little bit. We've pivoted to creating, again, this AR software uh, because we, we see, really see that as the future of what um, you know, AR, VR, the social computing really looks like. Is we said, we might as well start here. So over the past, we'll say, yeah. year, um, we've been developing the software. It is actually out on the App Store. Uh, we released it, we'll say, six months ago. And what it allows folks to do is take any uh, 3D asset, you know, say you're, again, in the engineering school or the architecture school, right? And you are creating 3D assets, you're designing buildings, you're designing engines, whatever it is. You can take those 3D assets, take that out of that software, and throw it into our software that we've made. And the demo that I want to show off is uh, hopefully going to, you know, once we get it up and running, uh, going to show how easy it would be to show off how uh, a student can, again, come into a classroom setting, take that uh, file, that asset, okay. put it into their iPhone, put it into their iPad, and then present it off to their classroom or you know whoever it is that they're working with. Um, it's an ADA. If we can't get to it, I can always pull up a video demo. Um, so I guess uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give them a second or two, and then if it works, it works. Then if not, I'll show up the video. But live demo is always more fun. I accept the challenge. So I guess quick question before we jump into this. Um, of those of you that, again, haven't heard much about AR and things, oh, looks like we're good. OK, I'll get back to this question in a second. OK, Kevin, go ahead. Let's run through the demo, and then you do your thing, and we can uh, jump back into questions and things like that. Sure. And what this demo is is a app we built out to kind of show off the potential of AR and VR on a mobile device. So pretty much this app can be distributed by going to, like, say, the App Store, downloading it, or a, um, in, the, in that case. So um, let's go ahead and drop into maybe the this thing. So here we have a small, tiny little Tesla Model S. And you can walk around it. You can kind of look around. But that's the small scale version. And we have this little button here that enables true scale. We hit that. Well, now we have a big size Model S, full size. So. It's going to park it right here in the middle of the room. So and with a, this, this is a LeSean for scale. Yeah. This is true scale, exact height. Yeah. And something we can do is, well, he peer into here. Boom. And let's go ahead and interact with the world and maybe hide the windshield. There we go. So, oh, there's the laser <laughs> from the <laughs> projectors. And yeah. this is the type of experience that we can achieve with AR. So. Uh, that's the presentation here. Um, the other power of this, too, is being able to show things you can't really bring into your space easily. For example, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the, uh, what's this, the Falcon Heavy in real life. Here's a small scale version. Yes, that's and a small it version. It actually is still pretty big. And let's go ahead and hit this true scale. And as you can see here, it goes all the way up. And that's how big these engines are, too. If anyone's interested, we can go outside and do it. It's way more fun. <laughs> but yeah, so that's the type of experiences that we have. Um, let's see. So something for like engineering. Maybe you want to present something. Uh, here is an example of a jet engine. And let's go ahead and make it huge and look at it. And we can go ahead and maybe even take it apart too. So I'm gonna hide this, the casing, 
and we can see the each uh, the ind individual parts of the jet engine. Walk around it, look around it, kind of demo it off. And it's a it's a way to tell a story, is what I like to say it is. So that's the part of my demo, and I'll go ahead and drop it to LaShawn. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. So uh, I think we can, can we switch back over to the slides, uh, Rohan? So at that point, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty much wrapping up um, as far as what we have to show off, and I would like to open the floor to questions. Uh, thank, again, thank you so much for listening and uh, all that. Uh, who wants to go first? I think I saw you first, so I'm going to go. Have them like spin animates. Yeah, sure. So the yeah. question was, can we? It sounds like can we manipulate it beyond uh, rotating, scaling, and translating it? Is that right? So the way it works right now is it's it's very <laughs> it's very static, right? It's it's just a static model coming in. Um, we do have support for animations. Uh, if you decide to, hey, I want to animate this thing out, I want to upload it with the animation in there too. Um, so we just don't happen to have those in the demos we have today. But it, you are more than welcome to uh, download the app, sign up, and upload an animated asset, and we can try that out. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, great question. So the question was, is there a limit to the size of the model? So uh, the way it works today is you know, we are, uh, I guess if you want to think about it like this, we're taking software, or we're taking assets and files out of an engineering software, an architecture software, putting it into a, basically, a phone, right? Like we're going from a massive rig or a server into a tiny little phone. So we are trying to do our best to take that big file, compress it down, do some processing, all those things, and then again, get it into a mobile optimized scenario here. Um, so that's how that works, and I guess to directly answer your question, the, the number that we have hit that is the breaking point, or, the, or I should say the overheating point, is, uh, is it's about 100 megabytes. Is we can do about a 100 megabyte scene, and uh, as long as you get your file under that size, it should work. Uh, as long as you're using you know, a newer iPad Pro or an iPhone 10 or something like that, uh, you should be good to go. Again, I, my hope is that as the hardware gets better and as our uh, algorithm for compressing the files gets better, we can support bigger and bigger scenes and have better and better compression. I know that's going to be one of the biggest hurdles for the industry is how do you do um, just content distribution? How do you do that? How do you do that really well? How do you do it fast? How do you do it where it streams right to your phone, just like how you stream a video? Right? What is the, uh, I think I've heard this a lot, uh, what is the JPEG of, uh, of VR? Right? Like you know, before we had PNGs and bitmaps, and those are very large file sizes, very uh, uncompressed kind of files. As soon as JPEG came in, they were able to compress that with the codices. We need that same thing for AR and VR. And if we can do that, then we can really have this kind of ubiquitous, you know, sharing social kind of thing with VR itself. Hopefully, that answers the question and more. Yes, so the question was, is there uh, textures and colors in the model? So uh, that is coming very, very soon. We've been working really hard on that. Um, we decided when we released, we just wanted to release it and get people using it, right? And just get feedback as much as we could. So we released with just the gray model just to start, um, you know, because a lot of the feedback we actually got from the architects and engineers we were working with were, hey, I don't really care about the texture. Like, I just want to see it because, man, I can, I can see it now, right? Like, that's new. So. Uh, textures and materials, that is all coming soon. Hopefully quarter through this year, we can release an update with that. That's basically top of our priority list ever since we've launched. Um, it's quite a challenge because you know, that's just more files and more assets. We have to, again, compress, aggregate, and kind of be able to spit out in a nice way. So hopefully uh, we, we are on track with that and we can release that and get that going. Yeah, great question. So the, the, the way the animation works uh, as it is today you know, is you drop it in there and it would just loop. And I think we want to extend on that functionality, of course. But yes, th that would be the starter way to do it. Or if you know, your animation just plays once, then we could do that as well. Right, absolutely. So um, regarding labels, the way we've been suggesting folks do that today 
is we just tell them, hey, you can model out that label. Right? You model out that label, put it out there in 3D space, because that's going to look even more immersive than having a 2D label that we add. I know eventually that's going to be something we want to be able to do, and especially integration with, like, directly with the, the 3D software that's being used to create that asset. So if you name it a certain thing, we can pull that name and put it on there. So when you tap, it shows that name and other metadata, other assets that are tied to it. I know that's especially important for the architects as they use their, um, their special, uh, they call it BIM, you know, uh, modeling software that actually has all that extra data. You know, it knows that this screw is this size and it's from this manufacturer and this, all this stuff, right? So it's a little bit more uh, high fidelity, right, so to speak. Um, I could probably show you today, but I, I might not because technical things. But the way it works is uh, you hit File, Export, and then you go on our website and you hit Upload, and that's it. Yeah, so what, it doesn't matter if it's 3D Studio Max, if it's Blender, if it's Revit, if it's SketchUp. You know, pretty much we take all those file formats. You know, as you export it out, as long as you export it with the right settings that we support, that will, you know, it, that'll create that end-to-end -end pipeline from, again, that 3D software to finally our app. Uh, to uh, add to that, we um, take FBX and STL files. Yeah, those are the two. Any other questions from you? Any other questions from anyone else? All right. Well, this has been fun. Or how are we on time? Oh, I got like way more time. <laughs> Whoops. All right. Well, um, that's all I have, and you know we could probably show off more if you guys like to see anything else. Um, is there anything that you want to show off, Kevin? Um, yeah, that's about everything. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, maybe we could give a quick demo of how we can load up a, a project, right? And maybe that's how we wrap up. And if you guys have more questions, we can go from there. Um, I think. We need to, it's, it's going to be tricky because we're trying to mirror it and there's no internet connectivity and it's coming from the cloud and those things. Are we going to be able to do that, actually? Uh, I would have to show off on the iPad itself. Okay, so yeah. we'll do that. We'll yeah. just wire into the computer and do it that way. Yeah. Okay. Let's start. So I guess I'll narrate as Kevin does things. Um, so right now, if you uh, head over to projects.solidhouse.com, that is how you can log in and um, you know manage the the assets and the files and the projects that you set up in there. Um, and I think we're just going to mirror the screen of the iPad to the, to the computer, and then we'll show you, again, the, the computer and the iPad at the same time. And Kevin probably have, has some sample files that we can upload and try out, and we can see how that whole process works, again, end to end. Um, fingers crossed the Wi-Fi is good, and uh, things download quickly. All right, there's the iPad. So we're networked in. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the app. And from here, we'll jump back to projects. And you can see Boom. we have the projects mirrored over here. And I can go into here. Let's go ahead and get rid of these. Uh, so some of these. Previous example. I'm just, uh, so some of these projects that you're looking at right now, this was some of the, some work that we were working on with the Air Force. They were, uh, trying to see how they could integrate something like this into um, kind of a training scenario where they could, you know, add in models of, you know, uh, air, you know aircraft or maintenance things and things like that. And then I basically uh, add all that stuff in there. Yeah, and from there... I So we do have a demo for that, and I can show you after this. So um, as you can see there, I uploaded a file onto our front end, and from there, once we click on it, go ahead, loads, downloads that model onto the iPad. And after this process, depending on the network speed, we'll just... Come on, Wi-Fi. Yeah. If 
this doesn't work, we can show you that house model. We do have that um, on the app already. Uh -huh. um, actually, it might be better to show them a video example. Sure, yeah. So let me, I'll pull up a quick video, I guess, while this loads. Sorry, Wi Fi. Yeah. So with their app, we're able to record video of your experience and maybe share to other people. And we have an example of just this. Okay. Uh, uh, this is an example of a student-built uh, house. And here, we super uh, use this app to overlay the house on top of the actual structure. And yeah. as you can see here, we hide the layers of the object, and we're able to expose the house in progress. And that's the example of the one-on-one -on -one scale of what the experience we provide. This was a prototype we released, um, we'll say roughly summer of 2017. Mm -hmm. And then this slowly evolved into the app as you see it today. So it, was, it looks a little different, but you know, the yeah. concept is pretty much there. Yeah. Uh, another cool thing about this house, this is designed by the students at UNLV. So we were able to work with those students to kind of get their files and assets into the app, into the phone, and really be able to see how that looks like. It's actually now built, and I think they're planning on moving this house onto the campus at UNLV and um, having it you know, for touring and all those things. A fun little example of how we, this was useful was when the truck driver tried to tow the house, they didn't understand if this overhang was too much and if it would hit the cab or not. So we just superimposed it on top of the cab, and from there we were able to tell you that won't hit. Yeah, that will clear it, no problem. So little things like that is a tool students can use to kind of tell their story really quick. Absolutely. Yeah, so I'll let that go. It looks like this thing is still loading. So maybe we can just do the house in real life and just try that out. Okay, so let's just jump over to the house then. Uh, hopefully this switches. Okay, so here we have the project house. So this is that um, same house that we just saw. Small scale. Uh, just a little example of the layerings feature, let's go ahead and expose maybe the hide the roof, 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 roof. there she is. Yeah, and the students provided us everything from the structurals and, the, and that's how we would get this information. So let's go ahead and make it true scale. Unfortunately, I can't walk around with balance whole wire, but we can kind of look around and see everything of this house. The cabinetries, the furniture, each of those can be hidden, exposed, and Revealed. Turn off the floor. So let's go hide the floor and see. That's that. There's all the structural in there. Yeah. So, yeah. So, as long as you model it out, as long as you have that content, we can get in it. You can upload it yourself, get it into the app, try it out yourself, and kind of explore and iterate through whatever it is you're designing. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, so the question was, do, can we do this AR thing, but also do it in a Google Cardboard kind of scenario? So, um, if those of you w who are unfamiliar with how Google Cardboard works, it's a, you know, cardboard box and slide it in your phone, and then you can see as if it was in VR. Um, the short answer is yes, we can do that. Uh, but the unfortunate answer is no, it's not enabled. Um, we, it, it is something we've thought about and trying to figure out what that looks like. Um, but the focus has really been purely um, AR. A, a lot of the things that we've been told from, again, customers that we've worked with is that I don't feel comfortable putting a headset on my face. You know, I have to, you know, it makes me feel like I don't know what's going on, I feel unsafe, you know, like, and again, this was the solution that we were able to come up with, again, for those architects is, hey, you can hand your client, your, your customer, the, the iPad, go out and have them walk around, they feel safe, they know what's going on. You know, they don't feel disoriented. And I don't know, I'm not even saying motion sickness, I'm saying, like, I don't know where I am. <laughs> so, uh, I think we're at time, and I don't want to, you know, I want to be respectful and not take up any more time, but uh, thank you so much for listening and talking. Um, uh, I will not be here for the event later tonight, but Kevin will be, so if you guys have more questions, feel free to ask him. Do it, and we'll take a picture too. Oh, the shadow. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty close to you. Come back. Come back. <laughs> you can actually, there we go. There we go. There we go. Hey, hey very close. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone.